hello and a very very warm welcome to you my name's Noel and I'm going to share with you a passage from the uh, psychological commentaries on the teachings of Gurdjieff and Uspensky by someone called Maurice Nicole although I believe it's pronounced Nicole because he was from Scotland <coughs> place called Perthshire and they would say Dr. Morris Nickel N-I-C-O-L-L -L, Nickel Morris Nickel and people with great clout and authority within the fourth way have actually told me personally that it is Morris Nickel not Nicole so from now on on this channel you shall be hereafter named Morris Nickel, and I'm going to read from a section of paper. It's a very, very brief paper from volume three of the commentaries, and it's on relaxation and the utter importance of being able to relax. To be here, now, no expectations about the future, no hesitation, no queries, no hang-ups about the past. They don't exist. The past has gone. The future has not arrived. We have this moment now in which we are. And in the next moment, we may not be. So to centre ourselves within this moment, with, and, and for me, when I do these exercises, the most important thing is to dispel, to get rid of the biggest culprits of all, which take us out of the moment and being here and now. And they are expectations, desires, uh, hopes for the future, fears for the future, etc., etc. Just, just dispel them and actually get to a place of being here and now. And I'd like to thank all my new subscribers thank you very very much indeed for subscribing and uh, I hope you enjoy the material and possibly gain something from it and before I read the paper from volume three of the commentaries I'm going to give a little introduction about this Dr Morris Nichol because uh, people who have just subscribed who are just getting into the fourth way may not have heard of him and he was an English gentleman who in the 1920s had a very, very famous uh, medical practice in a place called Harley Street, which is in central London beh behind Oxford Circus. And he was incredibly successful. He was a neurosurgeon in the private sector of the health industry in Britain. And he was friends with a gentleman who I believe was a poet called Peter Piotr Uspensky. And Uspensky said to Maurice Nicol one evening that a certain teacher was coming to London to give a talk. And this gentleman's name was George Ivanovich Gurdjieff. And Nicole felt, felt quite excited. And he said to his friend Uspensky, OK, book me in. I'll go along and see what this Mr Gurdjieff has to say. And they trudged along to the meeting hall, which was in Wigmore Street, which is literally two streets away from Nichols' practice. And Gurdjieff spoke for about an hour. And afterwards, Nichols said to Uspensky, my life has just changed. I've actually found the direction which it's going to take now. And within the space of, I believe, less than two weeks, he, Maurice Nichols, actually sold his practice in Harley Street, sold most of his London and Scottish property, and went to a study centre which Gurdjieff had in a place called Fontainebleau, which is in the outskirts of Paris. And Maurice Nicol actually dedicated his life for the next 40 years or so to actually working with Gurdjieff, and not only working with him, but actually writing about the work and for many, many years, he had a secretary called Beryl Pogson. And she was his secretary, secretary for 14 years. And after working with Gurdjieff, 
he came back to the United Kingdom and his secretary, Beryl Pogson, actually founded a group of her own in a place called the Dicker uh, in the southeast of the United Kingdom. And apart from working with Gurdjieff, uh, Maurice Nicol left us five blisteringly uh, elucidating, helpful commentaries about the work. And I'm getting quite a lot of feedback about people contacting me who have who have become familiar with the work through the commentaries of Maurice Nicol, uh, and it's quite extraordinary. And every now and again, as you will see from my channel, I actually become inspired and I read a section from uh, Nicol's commentaries. So that was just a brief introduction. Nicol was one of the people who was closest uh, of anyone to Gurdjieff, uh, along with Uspensky. And that was just a, a little fill-in for people who are new to the work and, and what is going on. And this section that I'm going to read, it's only about it's less than two pages. It's about relaxation and the importance of being able to relax. And I have this apartment here and it's in central London and it, it is so quiet, almost 24 seven, one could hear a pin drop. And I, I do my work, I write my essays, I do my videos. And I feel this, this, this incredible sense of peace and well-being. And I don't expect anything. I don't particularly want anything. Uh, I'm just here and the stuff is flowing through me. And it's a very, very beautiful place to be. As I said when I began the talk, just to be here now in this moment with no expectations and no desires at all. Nothing. And this section, which I'm going to read for you, begins, it's very, very bright on my face, on page 908 of volume three of the commentaries. And it was written in a place called Quermead, Eugley, in the United Kingdom, the southeast of the United Kingdom, on June the 15th in the year 1946. And the title of the paper is a note on relaxation and he uses the term man to refer to someone I'm going to say person or he or she uh, I just think it's more suitable a person fully awake has no false personality that's the first line I'm going to repeat it a person fully awake has no false personality for, for us who are studying how to awaken, this means that the more awake we are, the less we are in false personality. Or to put it the other way around, the more a person is in false personality, the more is that person asleep. Now, a person who is asleep in false personality has no real existence. There is no real person. I'm going to stop there. I intended to make this 10 minutes, but it's going to go on a little bit longer. When you actually meet a real person, it's the most exquisitely beautiful thing in the world. Someone who has no false personality. Someone who is totally and utterly real. And nearly all our difficulties in life, when I look back at my past life, have actually stemmed from having faith in people who are not real in any shape or form and by identifying with them and I no longer do that. A, a person must become quite open to themselves without deception. This is true relaxation. They must cease to, they must cease to hold in themselves certain beliefs about themselves, poses, pictures, ideas of themselves. Anxiety and fear, which prevent us from relaxing, subtly arise when a person endeavours to maintain what is not really himself. He lives on one side of himself at a time, and the rest is dark to him. 
he is not open to himself. The false personality, always preoccupied with different forms of internal considering, with questions of whether a good impression is being made and appearances kept up, causes a strain in being. Now, now this, this is the most incredible thing of all. When we try to put on a front and we are aware of possibly creating, creating impressions and so on, uh, through our false personality, our being is being drained of all the energy that otherwise it could accumulate and we could develop from because we've been taken hostage by a stranger, someone who is not us. Bear with me a moment, please. It is if a man kept on standing on his toes and did not understand why he felt exhausted. All the time he is keeping something up which is not himself, something imaginary, something which does not fit, which does not fit him. And this happens with everyone. If we had no false personality, all this anxiety and nervousness which, which all secretly feel about themselves, whether they admit it or not, would vanish. Not only would our relationships to others change, but our relationships to ourselves would change also. We then would understand what it means to relax. One reason is that the false personality can only love itself. Self-love, which attributes everything to itself, keeps us in anxiety, for it, is for it is afraid of loss of esteem and position. Now, false personality never admits anything. It is always right. If it pretends to confess its sins, it does so out of vanity, as opposed to show off to gain merit and applause. This absurd thing composed of self-evident lies and false imagination, you might think easily seen and therefore easily destroyed. On the contrary, its existence is most difficult to see and its strength is extraordinary. It will neither allow itself to be found out nor allow ourselves to find ourselves out. That is what we really are. If it did, its power would be destroyed and we should, we should be free from our greatest enemy, that is the person we imagine ourselves to be. Our greatest enemy, the person we imagine ourselves to be. There's something underneath, obviously, what we think ourselves to be, which is absolutely freaking awesome and so, so incredibly powerful. And it's you. It's what you are when all the false personality and all the societal things that have been put upon you about playing a part in society and actually fitting into its agenda. When all those are stripped off and you have no expectations and no desires, then you actually discover the greatest thing you will ever discover, which is you. Let me find my place now. Uh, the person we imagine ourselves to be whom we serve as slaves from the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we fall asleep at night. So we cannot deeply relax when we serve in this way, for false personality will keep on making us correspond to what it imagines itself to be. It will not allow a person to rest. What it will not allow a per sorry, it will not allow a person to be at rest, but must prod them to act in the way that, that they are supposed to act, to keep up their reputation, their 
character role. So if a person has a picture of themselves as being a hard worker, this false personality will drive them to work so hard, even to the point of death. It makes each of you, every one of us, keep up our pictures of ourselves. Now the strength of the false personality depends upon buffers. Before I go any further, I'll explain what buffers are. You know, at the end of a railway track, there's these circular discs which are heavily padded and they just stop the carriage crashing into the wall and causing chaos. We have these within us because we are contradicting through the many eyes within us. We are contradicting ourselves continually on a daily basis and there's buffers there so we don't see the contradictions. One moment we can like this, the next moment we can hate it, one moment we can say this, we can say that, and we're constantly uh, changing the way that we think about things. And there's buffers put there to stop the impact of these contradictions actually smashing together. And one of the major aspects of the work is to slowly release these buffers because real I and true being cannot be experienced unless the buffers are released. Uh, but they must be done very, very slowly. If a buffer is released too quickly, a person will see the contra contradiction simultaneously and there will be some kind of explosion, a psychic, ex a psychic explosion, because they're seeing the two contradictions simultaneously. So the buffers are taken off slowly. So just to, that was just a brief description of, of, of buffers. And the final part of the paper on relaxation. Now the strength of false personality depends upon buffers. Its strength is not in its self-evident lies and false imagination, but in the buffers that lie like walls in centres and prevent us from seeing more than one side at a time, as I've just said. When he says centres for the new people here, we are comprised... Uh, of basically in three major centers which are the which are the thinking center the intellectual center the emotional center the feeling center and the instinctive moving center which is the body and they usually work out of alignment with one another and problems arise from this so a part of the fourth way work is to bring all the centers in harmony as a unison And the centres prevent us from seeing buffers in this buffers in this buffers the vampire slayer. Ah, uh, I've only seen bits of that, but I just lose interest after a few minutes. But it was very very popular, but nothing to do with Morris Nickel. Buffers and the vampire slayer. Find your place, Nolan. Get on with it. My goodness. Uh, so these buffers prevent us from seeing more than one side at a time so that we do not see inner contradictions. They prevent us from bringing two things together, both of which we know separately. Because they have this curious action, lies and imagination have the power to control us. That is, to make us simultaneously more and more conscious on what lies on either side of a buffer. Ordinarily, we would be conscious only of what lies on one side and after a lapse of time of what lies on the other and therefore we would see no contradiction. So the false personality through the action of buffers prevents us from meeting ourselves. Meeting ourselves. It prevents a person from becoming open to themselves without deception. There's only a few more lines left. Can you imagine having lived for like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever years, and meeting yourself for the first time? Can you, can you actually imagine it? I think it would be great. Uh, I listened to a talk today someone gave on somewhere or other from New York, uh, something related to the work. Uh, and he was saying people are constantly running around doing stuff uh, to avoid themselves because they don't want to be alone with themselves. 
and to be alone with yourself when you discover yourself is the most beautiful, rapturous thing in the world. Final few lines now. I hope the sound's working okay on this thing because I'm usually right up close to it when I'm giving the audios. But I'm at a bit of a distance now. Let's, it will influence C. We'll look after this. So it is necessary to practice self-observation over a long period of time until its memory, which records both sides of a buffer, is strong enough to influence us. This makes it quieter. There is such a noise going on inside due to false personality. So many eyes shouting that we cannot relax. That la end of section of the paper on relaxation, volume three, uh, page 908-909. Uh, glorious. Everything is summarised within, I don't know, a hundred lines or something. And as I say, this is a talk on relaxation relaxation and just listen to the final line again uh, there is so much noise going on in false personality so many eyes shouting that we cannot relax and those eyes that are shouting we need to take hold of them and go <coughs> and throw them away A major, if not the major aspect of the fourth way is that we are placed on this planet as self-developing organisms. That's our purpose for being here, to develop up the ray of creation higher and higher and to evolve. And everything in this work actually shows us how to do it, how to do it, how, 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 how. This was supposed to be 10 minutes time in the fourth way system it's known as the merciless hero pass uh, and i think outside of one's consciousness time doesn't exist it is a complete and utter illusion i sit here working and i go out and i do stuff and one moment it's sunday and the next moment it's sunday again with no lapse in between we are in the presence of the mystery and the more relaxed we are and the more quiet, and the more all these eyes are silenced, the more we tap in to that mystery. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but the present is a gift. That's why it's called the present. And I'm sure it is. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, any questions or queries or anything, I'm more than happy to help if you drop me an email or leave a comment or something. But relaxation is where it's at. Nothing outside me, outside my immediate sphere, uh, has sway over me or power unless I allow it. And the eye that, that's allowing the noise is an eye that is not you. It's one that's taking you hostage. And from the moment of zero to five, when we are born, we are in essence. And from five, we learn a language and we are surrounded by sleeping negative people whom we imitate. And we fall asleep amongst them. And I read something by uh, Gurdjieff the other day, and it's a beautiful quote. And he says, the system that puts you asleep will not be the one that wakes you up. Lots of love. And thank you for watching now. Bye.